This episode is brought to you by La Quinta by Window. Your work can take you all over the place, like Texas. You've never been, but it's going to be great because you're staying at La Quinta by Wyndham. Their free bright side breakfast will give you energy for the day ahead. And after, you can unwind using their free high-speed Wi-Fi. Tonight, La Quinta. Tomorrow, you shine. Book your stay today at LQ.com. Hello, and welcome to Slate Money, your guide to the business and finance news of the week. I'm Felix Salmon of Axios with Elizabeth Spires of New York Times and Paces. Hello. I'm here with Emily Peck of Axios. Hello. And we have an amazingly fun episode this week. We are going to talk about vibe sessions. We are going to talk about Red Lobster. We are going to talk about stock buybacks. We're going to have a whole arty segment about the intersection between fast food and art in the Slate Plus. And the reason why this is such an amazingly special and awesome show this week is because we have none other than Kyla Scanlon coming on as a special guest. Kyla, welcome. Thank you for having me. Kyla, you have a new book out. What is it called? It's called In This Economy. And it is a guide to everything. Yeah, money and markets specifically, but everything else also. (laughs) Money, markets, money and markets. Other than that, you are like the queen of all things social media. Where does one find you when you are not on Slate Money? Yeah, yeah. So I am across social media on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, or X, I guess, at Kyla Scan. Have a YouTube channel, have a podcast called Let's Appreciate, have a newsletter, kyla.substack.com, and the book is out May 28th. The queen of all media. I guess it doesn't feel that way, but yeah. Your TikTok yeah. is amazing. <laughs> Thank you. It sounds exhausting is what it sounds. Um, that's a word for sure to, that could be applied. <laughs> um, no, it's always very fun. Like uh, the goal with the book is, is similar with the social media to educate about the economy, give people the tools that they need, foundational knowledge to understand the world around them. So check out Kyla on all the channels, but only after you've listened to all of this coming up on Slate money. Reboot your credit card with Apple Card, the only credit card designed for iPhone. It gives you up to 3% daily cash back on every purchase. Plus, Apple Card has no fees, not even hidden ones. Apply for Apple Card now in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card issued by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, Salt Lake City branch. Subject to credit approval. Variable APRs for Apple Card range from 19.24% to 29.49% based on creditworthiness. Rates as of February 1st, 2024. Terms and more at applecard.com. So, Emily, you have been writing a bunch this week about polls. There was a big Harris poll in The Guardian. And this is a subject we have covered many times in the past but it seems to be bigger than ever right now, which is the disconnect between what Americans think the economy is like and what the economy is actually doing. And what was it like 50% of Americans think we are in a recession right now? 56% of Americans think we are in a recession. Yeah, this was the Harris Guardian poll. About half of Americans think the stock market is down, it's up. About half think we have record high unemployment. We have record low unemployment. They don't believe positive economic news from the media. So when you run a story that says, no, there's no recession, people are like, you're a liar. I know this because I ran the story that said there's no recession and people are being really mean to me about it. But technically, there is no recession. It's not even technically. There is no recession. There is no recession. But as Kyla has coined and made famous, there is another kind of recession, right? Vibe session? Well, this is like the epitome of the vibe session, right? That we, we know there's a recession because vibes. Is there any other reason? Are you asking me? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was uh, stunned by the question. I, I don't know. I've actually been rolling around with this poll for the past, you know, since it got released because it's almost like disheartening to see the statistics. And so the vibe session is this idea 
of a disconnect between consumer sentiment and economic data. And so I coined the term back in 2022 when, you know, economic data was improving, like inflation was finally going down, GDP was relatively steady, the labor market was doing okay, uh, but people were feeling tremendously bad, right? We see that in the consumer sentiment metrics and this recent poll it is a confirmation of the vibe session, but it's, I feel like it's actually something deeper because, um, as Emily said, it's like the truth doesn't even matter anymore. Like the S&P 500 is up 12%. That's objective. And that's just since January. You're right. And it was up 23% last it's year. It's all-time highs. Nuts. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's and, just facts. I, the editor that ran the story at Axios was like, I... D- I just don't understand why people are being so mean. I mean, th- it's just true that the stock market is up. Like, what? But the weird <laughs> thing is, when when the stock market is down, the classic mm-hmm. journalistic trope is that Americans are looking at their four hundred one ks and are seeing massive losses, and this is making them sad somehow. Mm-hmm. Now, as a good passive investor, I never look at my four hundred one k, so I have no idea. But I'm I will grant you for the you know sake of rhetoric and argument the americans do look at their 401k's and feel rich when they're up and poor when they're down but if that's the case then you would think that they would be looking at their 401k's and going oh my god i've never been so rich i think some of this uh, there's a political element to it which i know it's unsurprising that i would say that but during the trump administration almost every day he got up and said look at the dow look at the dow look at how high it is And the Biden administration doesn't do that. And even though I don't think people look at their 401ks that frequently, and, and, you know, that's not really the way that they think about the stock market or uh, the way I think average people think about the stock market. But if you have somebody who has a one note message that says, look at this one metric that we all know is not necessarily the, the best or even a good economic indicator, but most people don't really understand that. The Dow is a brand they understand. And you have somebody standing up every single day saying, this looks great. And then you have a new administration where that kind of messaging just doesn't exist. Instead, you're trying to talk about complex metrics that people don't necessarily understand. And I think one message is more effective, regardless of whether it's relevant, because it's just very simple. You said something interesting there, Elizabeth, about how like normal people think about the stock market. And given that 49% of people think that the stock market is down, I guess that's my question is, how do normal people think about the stock market? I am well, I'm perfectly willing to accept I am not a normal person. But <laughs> if I was a normal person, how would I think about the stock market? And is it really the case that all it takes for me to change my mind on the stock market is for Donald Trump to say the stock market is up. And then I'm like, oh, I didn't realize that the stock market is up. But if Emily Peck says the stock market is up, or if Kyla says the stock market is up, we, we're like, you're lying. No, they believe Kyla probably. <laughs> it's about, I think, exposure to information about financial markets, which most people are not going out of their way to consume. And so if you pulled somebody off the street and said, where do you think the Dow is right now? Where do you think the S&P is? Where is your you know, retirement portfolio up, they don't know. But if they're already consuming, you know, some big mass market news and, you know, the president is saying the Dow looks amazing right now and I'm responsible for it. People hear that enough. They kind of assume that it's true. So Kyla, let me ask you as the, as the person who's plugged into the kids these days, (laughs) do people look at the stonks? Do they know whether it's up or down? Or is it only the elite who follow you? (laughs) Oh, only the elite. No, no, it's a whole mix of people. This is like a big question, right? Like is the stock market the economy? And obviously the stock market is not the economy, but I think a lot of people don't look at it. Like 62% of Americans do own stocks, but most of that is in their 401k. And I think most people just sort of sit on that for a while. I do think it is a, a medium and a message sort of issue with this poll is unveiling. I think it is like, lack of messaging about the stock market being up or people feeling totally disconnected from that. But I think mostly it's just maybe a misunderstanding or a gap between, I mean, like all of the, but what the poll shows is that people feel really bad about everything. Like it's not just the stock market. It's like, they think we're in a recession. They think unemployment is at an all time high. And I think that is more of a messaging issue than people like seeking out that information, if that makes sense. I, like, you see, I'm, I can't quite buy that. I don't think that the relatively small number of people who are, you know, plugged into right-wing cable news or right-wing talk radio or whatever, 
is remotely large enough to get to the kind of numbers we're seeing in this poll. Like, yeah, as you say, like... the vast majority of Americans don't really pay attention to the news at all. And the idea that there's some like, you know, mustache twirling messaging person who's telling everyone that like everything is bad and they're believing this person. I'm like, yeah, no, that's, most that's people, not yeah. what that's not how it works, though. That's not how, you know, these messages become memes. It's not centralized. It's not, you know, coming from particularly not coming from right wing sources. I mean, this is uh, Trump getting up and saying the Dow is wonderful was happening in every news medium you can think of. Right now, but right now, why do people think the stocks are down, unemployment is high and that we're in a recession? Because Where is right, that message coming the from? The right is still talking about gas prices. <laughs> And Biden is not saying, look at the Dow. He's trying to... You, you wait, so, okay, Elizabeth's, Elizabeth's yeah. theory is that it's politics, politics, politics. Emily, I, I'm going to assume you're not so bought into this politics. Experience. I am Imagine. not bought into the... I mean, the <laughs> politics is definitely why people are calling me a moron on X. <laughs> Setting that to the side, I think when you look into um, that Harris poll, Harris Guardian poll, around 60% of both Republicans and Democrats said that the high cost of living inflation is like a big concern and problem for them. And I really think bottom line, that's what this is. It's like you go to the store, shit is so expensive. Have you gone out to eat lately? I mean, it's wild, the prices. I mean, just like I was telling Felix the other day, like getting pizza for the family is like a hundred bucks, you know, family of four. It's just things are much more expensive than they used to be. I think Felix is going to write about this. I don't think the story will have pub by now, but it's coming. There's a story coming. You read Axios Markets on Tuesday, and I will give you Slate Money listeners a sneak peek of what is coming on Axios Markets on Tuesday, which is basically the meaning of the word inflation has changed. Mm. And it now means high prices. It no longer means rising prices. And the prices are too damn high to take a page from that rent guide that everyone still quotes from 15 years ago. But, you know, it's the prices are really high. That's squeezing people. That's not how the NBER measures recession. They don't look at inflation. They look at GDP. GDP could be amazing, but like to a regular person that's just trying to buy some eggs or whatever, it doesn't matter, you know? So I think that plays a really big role here. I, I agree with that, but uh, consumer spending is still super robust. So, well, no, you know, but consumer, for, well, consumer spending, stuff. Elizabeth, just to, just to be clear mm -hmm. about this, consumer spending equals the amount of stuff you buy multiplied by the cost of the stuff. And so if the cost of the stuff goes up, then the consumer pricing goes up. Yeah, but adjusting for inflation, it's robust. Yeah, but th no, that's what we're saying is that no one yeah. is adjusting for inflation. Well, and I'm curious what you all think about the poll, and, you know, to reference another poll, uh, which <laughs> is always a little bit sticky. But there's a poll that's out there that says, like, you know, 70% of people feel personally very good about their financial situation. They're like, I'm fine. But mm -hmm. if you ask them how they feel about the national economy, only 30% feel fine about that. And so that that's where I get sort of stuck. Like I think inflation is a total pressure cooker. We have a structural affordability crisis. Like housing is absurdly expensive. Like all of those are real truths, but I think there is something a little bit deeper beyond just that. Like, you know, people feeling okay, but then looking out beyond and being like, I hate everything. <laughs> yeah, no, I definitely, I definitely see that. I need, I need to shout out to Joe Salama happy belated birthday to one of our devoted listeners, Joe, who I had lunch with on Wednesday. And we had lunch at a lovely restaurant in Midtown. And it was just, you know, lunch. And there was a steak frite on the menu at Much lunch. Wasn't. And this steak frite was $82. Jeez. And on the one hand, there's like that sticker shock of like, how much? And on the other hand, the restaurant was perfectly busy and people were perfectly happy to be paying $82 for the steak free. So what you see in that like microcosm right there is a bunch of people who are perfectly well off financially, who are perfectly capable of paying $82 for a steak free and ha are living a very comfortable life, but also are looking at the $82 steak free on some level and saying, well, obviously this country has gone to hell in a handbucket if a steak free costs 82 bucks. And I think you can think both things at the same time. I, I think that's the thing with all of this is like one part of it is absolutely like we've had record high inflation and it's still a fight to get it down to where it needs to be. Healthcare is a crisis, like elder care, child care is up 32% since 2019. Like there are absolutely real economic reasons that people are in pain, but like also they're reporting things that are just not true. They're mm. responding to a poll with an opinion that's wrong. And I think that's kind of where things get weird. I think we should probably say at some point, Take all polls with a massive pinch yeah, of salt. Like really. polls by their nature are 
weird, unreliable things. You know, bless Harris, they try and do their best. But the fact is that pollsters doing their best is just so much worse on an objective scale than pollsters doing their best was 20 or 30 years ago. No one wants to <laughs> reply to pollsters except for the people who are completely, you know, they have a bee in their bonnet about like how terrible the economy is or something like that. So like you can try your hardest to adjust for that as a pollster and they do. But I think even the pollsters will concede that the quality of polls and the degree to which the responses to this poll are representative of the opinions of the country as a whole. That correlation has been, been deteriorating significantly for a very, very long time. That's true, but I, I, I would argue, you know, my firm does polling, some polling. It is a problem, but also, you know, these opinion polls are really just designed to tease out snapshot of public opinion at one point in time. And I do think that poll is reflective of what's happening in the, in the disconnect between what people feel about their personal situation and how they view the environment around them. And I do think that is a big function of the total information environment, not necessarily, you know, what's in my wallet today. I'm going to take the other side of that one. I think that it exaggerates the disconnect and the disconnect is not as big as you would think by looking at these polls. One of the other things that the media is quite endemically bad at is the way that we are a little bit like five-year-olds playing soccer and we all just run towards like the shiny object whenever we see it and a million polls come out every day and then the minute one shiny poll comes out and we all run to that poll and go this must be the poll that is reflective of the country as a whole and it's just like no, if, if that is so much of an outlier, then probably that was just like a bad poll in some way. Yeah, it's not an outlier poll, though. The other polls asking the same question, like, yeah, people think they're a recession, but the number is not that high. I mean, the, part of it is the way we decide when there's a recession is weird, right? It's the National Sorry. Bureau of Economic What's the R? Research. 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 The National Bureau of Economic Research, you know, months after the recession has started, comes out and says, there was a recession that started a few months ago. And everyone's like, okay, then. And until they make the proclamation, there there are stories that are like, sure seems like a recession, but it's not a recession yet. You know, that, that happens. That happened in 2008. It's actually not so like these people are morons. How could they think there's a recession? It's actually a legitimate thing where it can be confusing to understand exactly when a recession starts. If I recall correctly, like if you look at Q4 2021 and Q1 2022, we actually had two successive quarters of negative GDP growth, which was like the classical definition of recession before yeah. everyone gave up and decided we were going to go to the MBER instead. So like there, you know, it is, it is a fuzzy, um, concept but it is we are well within the fuzziness of no recession right now there is no yes. there is no world in which we are in a recession right now but like economists are kind of like you say pedants i was going to say another word that's not probably a nice word but you know they're <laughs> they're pedants like they're this is what a recession is and inflation you know is falling but prices are high but they're still inflation is falling but prices are still rising and it's like you just give me a headache you know what i mean so I don't know. There's this, this this way in the media of being like, actually, there's mm. not a recession and blah, blah, blah. And it's just... It <laughs> like that meme, the well, actually meme. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just so disrespectful of, of Americans. And I think anyone paying attention to media a little bit could sense that and kind of be resentful and stop trusting. And it, it's this sort of like horrendous cycle. This is, this is absolutely what I write in my piece about inflation, which is that if you're reading something about inflation... One of two things is true. Either it is a piece saying that inflation is high, or it is some guy actually. And if you're a normal human being, you'd much rather just go, well, yeah, prices are high, inflation is high, rather than like listen to some guy mansplaining that actually inflation is low. Inflation is so personal, too. I think that's like also the hard part about these conversations is everybody has a personal inflation rate, and everybody's impacted by it differently. And so oftentimes when you are like quoting national statistics, it can go right against people's anecdotes. And that's difficult to work through. Yeah, everyone has their own indicator. We've probably talked about this before, but someone emailed me the other day and they were like, I was writing about some other poll about financial wellness. And she was like, the reason people don't fi feel financially well is, you know, they're struggling with high expenses. For example, I recently came across a watermelon that cost $15. I'm not going to buy a watermelon that cost $15. You know, and that was her whole like... <laughs> 
trying to give me the context kind of a thing. And I was like trying to think, what's my $15 watermelon? Do you guys have yeah. I, I literally could not tell you how much a watermelon costs, but partly because whenever I get, whenever I do see watermelons in a supermarket, which is not very often, they always just price them per pound, and I have no idea how many pounds. So a watermelon hard is. to know. Yes, fifty nine cents yeah. a pound. It's a hundred pounds. I don't know. <laughs> So Emily, talking about money, this is something that I question myself about, which is if you have any money, you always have a choice between do you spend it or do you save it? And you have a heuristic. You have a rule of thumb. I don't. I think it's a really interesting <laughs> question. And it's been complicated lately by the fact that you can actually earn real interest on your savings. So it's a really important question. And here's what I've been wondering about. The really bad emergencies that come in life require usually a lot of money to deal with, like lots, right? If you lose your job, you lose all your income, you're going to need a, quite a bit of money to sustain yourself. Or if um, the tree falls on your house or you have some really bad medical emergency, you need a lot of money. So if, you, if the decision is save this little bit of money or spend this little bit of money. Just spend it. Just spend it. Because like it's not going to make any difference if you need a hundred thousand dollars to keep you going through your unemployment. Yeah, that's my latest thing. Is or I don't know if it's my latest thing, but it's something I was thinking about recently because we got a little bit of money and it was like, well. This is the message of my book as well. YOLO. You only live once. Live your life as much fun as you can when you can. So go out and spend money and enjoy yourself. But. Things come up, so you do need some savings. You're not saying people don't need to save money, but people should save money. They do need to save money, but they also need to spend money because otherwise life has no meaning. <laughs> and the U.S. economy falls apart. Reboot your credit card with Apple Card, the only credit card designed for iPhone. It gives you up to 3% daily cash back on every purchase. Plus, Apple Card has no fees, not even hidden ones. Apply for Apple Card now in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card issued by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, Salt Lake City branch, subject to credit approval. Variable APRs for Apple Card range from 19.24% to 29.49% based on creditworthiness. Rates as of February 1st, 2024. Terms and more at applecard.com. I want to segue actually from this into the other word that is there's this massive disconnect between what dependents think it means and what the general public thinks it means, which is bankruptcy. And we have a great story this week, which is that Red Lobster has filed for bankruptcy. And then whenever you see a headline saying Red Lobster has filed for bankruptcy, you then get a litany of stories basically saying what went wrong and it was all because of the endless shrimp or it was all because <laughs> private equity owners were extracting far too much money or it was far, all because they sold off their real estate and leased it back or you know it's, it was some crazy Thai conspiracy theory but it's all in the service of explaining how this obviously terrible outcome came to pass where in reality, at least the way I look at it, sometimes bankruptcy is an obviously terrible outcome and sometimes it's not. Red Lobster did say that it was closing 50 of its restaurants, but it has 700 restaurants and it is going to keep on serving lobster and shrimp and it is still going to be famous for its cheddar biscuits. And people like the product and then you can financially engineer the product with various capital structures and equity here and debt here and mezzanine that and leasebacks there. And you can wind up having an ownership structure that changes. And I feel like this should have been a much bigger shrug than it was and that people got very excited about the bankruptcy, but maybe not. I think it's because the initial story that came out really had to do with the endless shrimp aspect of this. And it became kind of a meme that the reason why they're failing for bankruptcy is that they didn't anticipate that people were going to eat as much shrimp as they did. <laughs> and that turns out to be not quite the case. But that's a more interesting theory, right? They did lose $11 million, apparently, on their oh, ultimate endless shrimp promotion, which, bless them. And of course, there is a wonderful quasi-true conspiracy theory about this, which is basically that the owners of Red Lobster were, oversimplify only slightly, a 
Thai shrimp farming operation. And the Thai shrimp farming operation realized that their equity in Red Lobster had gone to zero and was never going to be worth anything. So then they just came in and said, give everyone endless shrimp, because even if we can't make money on our Red Lobster stock, we can make money selling shrimp to Red Lobster. (laughs) And then, of course, everyone should read Luke Winkie's piece in Slate, in which he talks to the people who ate the endless shrimp. (laughs) And the people who served the endless shrimp to the people who ate the endless shrimp. And much hilarity follows from that. I mean, I think for some, the endless shrimp was an inflation hedge or a way to to deal with high prices. You just stay at Red Lobster all day and eat shrimp, and then you've solved your grocery store bill kind of right there. And then for the servers, it was a nightmare because the person sits at your table all day. You can't turn the table and you make very little money. And that's quite bad. But yeah, it, does, it doesn't It does seem like Red Lobster filed for bankruptcy simply because of the endless shrimp. That was just another thing they did poorly. Like the, the business just wasn't going very well. And then there's a whole sub genre of stories looking at how private equity may have destroyed the company by selling all the Red Lobster real estate and then making Red Lobster then have to pay rent on the real estate it used to own. That's like a whole... But but as I say, that is like all predicated on the idea that the company is now destroyed. And I don't think the company is now destroyed. I think that now that the company is no longer owned by a Thai shrimp operator (laughs) and is going to go back to being owned by people who have some vague idea of how to run a restaurant, like they have all of their restaurants and it's going to be just fine. But Kyla, again, as the, you know, queen of all things spending and money related... If you go to Red Lobster and order endless shrimp, does it behoove you to therefore tip more because you are sitting there eating shrimp for ages and your server is making less money? I don't think people thought about it that way. (laughs) Yeah, based on the the stories that was in the Slate article. I mean, I think the reason, like you were like, why is this such a big deal? I think the reason people paid such close attention to it is because so many things were happening within the story. (laughs) Like it was like, it was like, did the shrimp like bankrupt this company? Uh, And then, you know, the Thai union group. So the Thai union group came in, became the parent company, bought them from Golden Gate Capital, the private equity firm. And they were like, we're going to be your only shrimp supplier. (laughs) And so they got rid of all the other shrimp suppliers and they made Red Lobster buy the shrimp at above market rates. (laughs) And so, and I just think it's like almost like a a story that should be a documentary (laughs) because it's just, it's so dramatic. Um, It almost sounds like extortion by a shrimp. It does. It does. I had a theory here, which is that if the thing that is bad is the filing for bankruptcy, then really the problem is the debt. And the way that... Mm -hmm privately owned companies often structure their debt is they do this thing called pick toggle bonds. And a pick toggle is spelled P-I-K and it stands for payment in kind. And basically, instead of paying cash as a coupon payment on the bond, you just issue new bonds and people own more bonds instead of getting any money back. And this is and pick toggle bonds are notorious in capital markets as, as like signs of frothiness and the creditors not having any um, leverage. But I feel what we should have had here was piss toggle bonds. I feel that if Thai Union <laughs> just had payment in shrimp, <laughs> it would have solved all of the problems. All of the creditors could have been paid in shrimp. The landlords could have been pay- paid in shrimp, right? The landlords are like, where's my rent this week? And they suddenly a tractor trailer comes up with like a couple of hundred thousand kilos of shrimp and they're like there's your rent (laughs) problem solved yeah it's too bad shrimp isn't fungible here (laughs) i could solve a lot of problems slate could pay me in shrimp that would probably be okay you know slate used to pay me in wine (laughs) this is this is a true fact for the first few months that slate money existed no one knew whether it was going to take off or how much money it was going to make or anything and so I, i would just get a case of wine every so often from jacob weisberg nice yeah (laughs) <laughs> this whole episode did make me read again about, do you guys remember this? So Darden restaurant groups used to own Red Lobster. And like, I think it was like 2014, Starboard, the private equity firm mounted this like big activist campaign against Darden because they were like, you're doing everything wrong and badly. And they put out this really like 200 page PowerPoint presentation, <laughs> just tearing apart the Olive Garden. And it became just this very viral story because it had all these- Because they were like, doing the breadsticks wrong. <laughs> they were giving out too many breadsticks, 
too much dressing on the salad. And there's this famous page in the PowerPoint where they say like, everyone salts the pasta water. Olive Garden is not salting the pasta water. Like what the MUTF is wrong with Olive Garden. You're allowed to say fuck on this show that Emily. (laughs) No, they were. They were like, they are trying to save like five bucks on not degrading their pots by putting salt in the water and you're like and it was true i mean that you, seriously you gotta salt your pasta water to people the powerpoint was like you are an italian restaurant sir <laughs> put some salt in the water <laughs> and starboard was like very successful with the activist takeover it like really worked and now today like darden is doing relatively well compared to red lobster yeah. Unfortunately, Red Lobster was sold off before Starboard could come in yeah, and, and do Starboard, whatever. Yeah, Starboard was really angry that they sold off Red Lobster. <laughs> they were like, how dare you? They sold off Red Lobster as a way of like trying to keep Starboard at yeah. arm's length. And Starboard was really pissed off. But now I guess maybe in hindsight, they're like, I don't know. What do you think, Kyla? In, in hindsight, would they have preferred to hold on to Red Lobster and they would have actually been able to run it? much better than Thai Union Group? Or do you think that Red Lobster was like structurally doomed and (laughs) they dodged a bullet? Well, I think 2013 was like a horrible year for the seafood industry. There was a lot of antitrust regulation going up because all these fishing conglomerates were binding together and like raising the price of seafood. Who wear big shrimp. Yeah. And so I think like, you know, you said 2014 Starboard came in and was uh, doing some activist work. I, I think, I think the seafood industry sort of really got messed up in 2013. And that was kind of the beginning of the end for Red Lobster because their whole motto, they were like one of the first sit down restaurants in America. They were created in 1968 and they they wanted to bring seafood to middle America. Yeah. Um, And like, but you really need good shipping and like logistics. And if the seafood industry is crumbling, um, that makes all of that a lot more expensive and harder. First thing you know when you start going out to eat is don't order lobster when you're yeah. a thousand miles from the sea. Yeah, but Red Lobster wanted that. But they <laughs> needed really good logistics and it all fell apart. It's a supply um, chain story. That's yeah, it always is. It's, it's always, always a supply always, chain always, story. Always. It's, it's the frozen <laughs> trucks. They revolutionized fast casual or something. I thought it was one of those the middle class has disappeared. Like Macy's is declining. No Red Lobster. Like the people that Red Lobster was for don't exist anymore. So this is like, if you look at the Red Lobster revenue numbers, people are still really going out to eat at Red Lobster. And it's by far the number one seafood chain in America. There's like the number two isn't even, is distant, distant. What is it? Bubba Gump? I have no idea. But yeah, like they, fundamentally, there's still a lot of brand equity there, as our colleague Courtney Brown will tell you. Cheddar Biscuits. (laughs) I want to stick on this subject of financial engineering, and we shall answer a listener email from Hans de Bloy. Hans wrote in last week and said, Dear Slate Money staff, my question is fairly simple. Why aren't stock buybacks illegal? Couldn't it be construed as insider trading since it's management using company money to increase the value of their own stock options? Corollary, whatever happened to dividends? All right, Kyla, you've explained this in your book, I think. (laughs) Why aren't stock buybacks illegal? I mean, I think it's like, I wouldn't call it insider trading. It is another way of distributing money to shareholders. So like companies will buy back a certain amount of shares and that'll make the share price do something. And um, dividends would be issuing a payment from however much money that they're making. And, And so it's just a different way for a high growth company to reissue money to shareholders. There is a lot of pushback on them. Like a lot of people, like Apple's doing a $1 billion share buyback, I think. And people are like, what the heck is going on there? Nothing by Apple standards. But yeah, if you look at Apple's total share count outstanding, it has been falling drastically for years and years Mm -hmm. and years. They have been aggressively buying back their stock. And this is like the intuitive reason. and, And you can go back and read a bunch of Warren Buffett letters about why buybacks are a good thing. Basically, if you own a stock, then you're owning a certain percentage of the company. If you own one share and there are a million shares outstanding, then you own one millionth of the company. And so the value of your share is basically the value of the company divided by one million. And then if the company goes out and buys back half of its shares, then there's only 500,000 shares outstanding. And if even if the value of the company hasn't changed at all, the value of your share has doubled. 
because you know you own one five hundred thousandth of the company rather than just one millionth. And this is particularly valuable, apropos what Hans was saying, to executives in companies that pay dividends because they have stock options and stock options give them the right to buy the stock at a certain price. And if the stock price is below the market price then they make money and the higher the stock price goes, the more money they make. If you have stock options and that stock is paying a dividend, all of those dividends that are going to shareholders don't come to you. Mm -hmm. Option holders don't get dividends. Only shareholders get the dividends. So if the company pays like a million dollars on dividends, the that doesn't really benefit the option holders. If the company takes that same million dollars and spends it on buybacks, it does benefit the option holders. So it feels a little bit like, yeah, this is the kind of thing that naturally executives would want to do. And certainly politicians on the left don't like it. And now it is being taxed. What is the tax? It's like 1% on dividend on, on stock buybacks now. And it doesn't seem to have slowed them down at all. I mean, I think a lot of the pushback against stock buybacks too is um, that the money might be suited for something better. You know, you don't see companies spending as much on R and D if they're uh, allocating so much money to buying back their own shares. So it's kind of like, you know, who are they answering to? Like shareholders or consumers? And increasingly, it does seem like shareholders. Yeah. What about paying the workers more? You know. Yeah. Right. Gosh, imagine that. Well, well, I mean, so. That's two different things. I, th I think this is also super interesting. Again, like if you look at it in the context of do you do a buyback or do you pay a dividend? Mm. You know, the amount of money you're paying in dividends is clearly money that theoretically you could instead be paying to workers. Obviously, shareholders aren't going to buy your stock or want your stock at all. If it never returns any money to shareholders, then the value of the stock is zero and you're going to have to fail. But there is at the margin, you know, you have to give some return to capital. And those, and those basically are the two ways you can do it. One is via a buyback, one is via a dividend. The dividend thing I, I can see as the, as the trade-off between do I give it to capital or do I give it to labor? The buyback thing is interesting. And I think Kylo is exactly right about this because buybacks tend to be much more variable. They come in like weird, unpredictable chunks. They happen opportunistically. And so it really is the kind of thing where like, if we have extra cash this quarter, we can spend it on like R&D or buying a new factory or something, or we can spend it on buybacks. Whereas dividends by convention are very, very solid and the idea, or very, very steady, I should say. And the dividend this quarter is the same as it was last quarter, it's the same as it was the previous quarter, and they only ever go up and they never go down. And it's much more sort of built into the cash flow, the long-term cash flow models of the company. And so when a company like Facebook comes out and says, we're going to start paying a dividend, that's a sign that Facebook is saying, like, our profits aren't just weird things that can come and go. These will exist forever. And it's, it sends a signal to the market that, you know, the profits are permanent. Reboot your credit card with Apple Card, the only credit card designed for iPhone. It gives you up to 3% daily cash back on every purchase. Plus, Apple Card has no fees, not even hidden ones. Apply for Apple Card now in the Wallet app on iPhone. Apple Card issued by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, Salt Lake City branch. Subject to credit approval. Variable APRs for Apple Card range from 19.24% to 29.49% based on credit worthiness. Rates as of February 1st, 2024. Terms and more at applecard.com. Families have a lot going on. Let Ollie help manage the mental load with new cognitive help supplements for everyone four and up, like delicious Lolly Focus Pops or Lolly Mellow Pops for kids. And for parents, try three new Brainy Chews to help you focus, chill out, or get energized. Find these cognitive health buddies for the whole fam at ollie.com. That's O-L-L-Y dot com. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Let's have a numbers round. Emily, do you have a number? Yes, I do. Which number shall I choose? Okay. My number is five, five dollars. That is the price of a new McDonald's 
meal bundle that's coming soon. It's a small drink, small fry, four piece nuggets, and either a McDouble, which is some kind of burger, or a McChicken sandwich, which seems like a very good deal. And this was really big news because right now, high fast food prices is really big news. People are unhappy with the fast food restaurants. They're say they're struggling a little bit because the the prices there have gotten so high that it's like not worth it to get fast food anymore. The whole thing about fast food is that it is cheap. So now this past week, Burger King also, Bloomberg had a story, some kind of leaked memo that Burger King is also going to do a $5 deal for people. And I mean, it's early and who knows, and you know, businesses are idiosyncratic and maybe people It's not that these places are too expensive. Maybe people don't like fast food as much as they used to. I don't know, but Mm -hmm. could be a sign of some deflation or that, you know, companies were using the inflation to raise prices. They were taking price. Is that how we say it? Anyway, they were using the inflation to raise prices um, because people were like unanchored and, and everyone was getting used to a world where prices were getting higher. So companies like McDonald's and Burger King were like, yay, finally we can raise prices and it's okay. But I think this could be a sign that they've sort of like reached a ceiling on that kind of strategy. And now, you know, they're doing these $5 meals and deals. And like, maybe that's a sign, a good sign for inflation coming down. That doesn't mean you know, prices are going to go back to where they were in 2019 or anything like that. But, you know, it's something. Uh, Elizabeth, do you have a number? My number is 22. And that's the number of land use reforms that localities are going to have to report whether they're conforming to or actually doing thanks to something called the YEMBI Act, which was just unanimously approved by the House Financial Services Committee and on a bipartisan basis. And what it does is it requires localities that receive federal money to actually publicly report the extent to which they're doing land use reforms, you know, designating things that were formerly single family homes into triplexes or duplexes, things like that. And it doesn't really force localities to, you know, be held accountable for not doing land use reforms. But what it does is it gives activists and more local people ammunition and data and reporting to hold their local officials accountable. I really like this because, it, like, you know, quite aside from the accountability thing, it creates my favorite thing in the world, which is a time series. We will be able to eventually, once this starts kicking in over time, we will be able to chart, you know, how many reforms are being implemented in how many different localities and are things getting better or are things getting worse. The first time we'll be like, this is good here and bad there. But then eventually we'll be able to see how the trends are going. And right now, it's everything is so incredibly anecdotal that having hard data on this is just super awesome in and of itself. I agree. My number is 2,579, which is not a dollar number. It's a billions of dollar number. $2,579 billion, or to put it a different way, $2.579 trillion is the market capitalization of NVIDIA which this is a little teaser number for next week when we're going to have Alex Kantrowitz on talking about all things NVIDIA and tech and AI, and it's going to be awesome. But $2.6 trillion is a just completely mind-blowing valuation for any company, you know, and especially one that was worth just a tiny fraction of that just a few years ago. This is more than the valuation of the entire German stock market, just to put it in perspective. How's it compared to Apple? It's about the same. Wow. There was a funny meme um, about that where they were like, well, yeah, NVIDIA has provided me more value than Germany has. So it makes sense they're (laughs) worth more. (laughs) So Kyla, bring us home. What's your number? Yeah. So my number is uh, 10%. And uh, Ethiopia, 10% of their auto fleet is now electric vehicles. They're actually moving to ban importing ICE and uh, vehicles, which is a move because it's very expensive to buy fossil fuels. This is out of an article from Clean Technica, and it just shows how quick a transition to electric can happen. I love that. Yeah. Go Ethiopia. But of course, the big asterisk there is that if you want to power the entire vehicle fleet in Ethiopia with electricity, then you need a pretty grown up and robust and reliable electricity grid. Yes. And so. yeah, it's been a minute since I was last in Ethiopia, but like it's not 
the world's greatest electricity grid. I'm not convinced that they could really cope with all cars going EV tomorrow. Yeah, I think that's everybody's problem all around the world is like, how do you build out a grid? It's certainly a much bigger problem in the United States than people give it credit for. And at some point, I am going to do a completely nerdy dive into transformers and how last mile electricity transformers are like one of the big electricity bottlenecks much more than like clean energy but not now that is to come (laughs) on a future episode of slate money we do have a slate plus segment coming up on taco bell my god Taco Bell, not only Red Lobster, but also Taco Bell. This is actually a story I absolutely love. But if you're not a Slate Money listener, then thank you for listening this far. Thank you to Jared Downing and Shana Roth and Jessamine Molly and Ben Richmond and the entire Slate team for putting this show together. We don't just throw this show together, you know. Thank you to everyone who writes in, especially Hans. And we will be back next week with more Slate money. McDonald's presents Burger Reviews by Hamburglar. Today's review, the hotter, juicier, classic burgers. Mr. Hamburglar. Bravo, bravo. He said, of all the McDonald's burgers I've ever hamburgled, these are the hottest, juiciest, and tastiest. Brubble. Hamburglery is on the rise. Get caught with a medium double cheeseburger meal for $6. Price and participation may vary. Promotion pricing may be lower than meal price. Comparison to prior classic burgers. Ba-da-ba-ba-ba.